Good morning, Grace Commons. We are so glad to have you here, both in person and online. Here are a few things that we would like you to know about. Tonight, our racial justice ministry invites you to join Scott Anderson and James Butler of InterVarsity Fellowship for a very thoughtful discussion on the biblical foundations for building multi-ethnic churches here at the church at 4 p.m. This week, as we enter into the season of Lent, we will host two Ash Wednesday services at noon and 7 p.m. in the chapel. These gatherings are a great way to begin and mark the 40 days before Easter as we lean into God more and more intentionally. Also, as part of Lent, come experience artwork by the Christos Collective. It'll be displayed at the church and online throughout the entire Lenten season. Finally, we're delighted to welcome the Boulder International Film Festival back to Grace Commons. Twelve films will be screened in our sanctuary next weekend. Be sure to check on our website for the complete film schedule. And that's just a few of the things happening at Grace Commons this week. Please check out our website for more. And now let's continue in worship. Good morning, church. Um, if you don't know me yet, my name is Ashley. I am the music and worship intern here at Grace Commons. And Joe is not here this morning, so I am music director. And we are welcomed by our incredible Annex College Ministry Worship team. Um, yeah, they lead our community um, with the spirit every Tuesday night. And we're so grateful for what they do on Tuesdays. And we wanted to share that with you. So um, we're going to get into our first song of worship. So feel free to stand. The spirit was moving over the water, the spirit come over us, come rest on us, come rest on us, as the spirit was moving over the water, the spirit come over us, come rest on us, come rest on us, so come.
Awesome. Thank you all. Will you listen this morning as I read our scripture from Deuteronomy 30? Obey the Lord your God and keep his commands and decrees that are written in the book of the law. And turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. Now what I'm commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It is not up in heaven so that you have to ask who will ascend into heaven and get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it. Nor is it beyond the sea so that you ask who will cross the sea to get it and proclaim it to us so that we may obey it. No, the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you may obey it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're going into one more song, and then after we'll be going into a time for young disciples. So feel free to make your way toward the front throughout this song.
Thanks for singing, y'all. Please be seated. Well, good morning, young disciples. I have a question for you. Do you know what these are? What? Stuff for fighting? Stuff for fighting. That's a good guess. Any other ideas? Go ahead. Yeah, they, they work great for water bottles, but... No, not, well, not drugs, no, no. Uh, this can go any which way, can't it? Um, do you notice, they're, they're, they're called, they're, they're, they're wine bags, and skiers use them now so that they can, you can wear them and when you get thirsty and you want a little bit of wine with your cheese for lunch. That's what they're for. Anyway, what's the difference between them? One's dark and one's light, okay. Any other things you notice about them? Yep. Go ahead. Yeah, this one looks older, doesn't it? They, yeah, they have different caps. Those are good observations. Well, the reason I have these is that Jesus, in today's Bible lesson, which your parents are going to hear, the adults, Jesus talks about Never put new wine in an old wineskin. Yes, it is. So let's let me show you what happens when you put new wine in an old wineskin. I'm going to show you this here. What's happening? It's leaking. It's leaking. Jesus understood that. This old wineskin, you can only use it once because the wine expanded it and made it have holes. Well, normal water works. It's, this is, you know what wine is. It looks, it's just grape juice. So we just didn't want to make a big mess with the grape juice. Yeah, that's right. So you never put the new wine, Jesus said, of the gospel into an old wineskin. So here's your homework. I want you to ask your mom and dad, what did Pastor Randy say in the adult sermon today about wineskins? And what might it mean for your family? Can you remember that? Ask them that question. Make them talk to you about that, all right? Let me pray for you. God, we thank you for each of these young disciples made in your image on a journey to know you and grow in faith. Give them grace this day as they go off to their lesson in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. It, it'll hold it just fine. Yeah, good question. You, it, it, you could, that probably works too. <laughs> Okay. Well, good morning, Grace Commons. Today, we are going to be bringing our All Things New series to an end. Uh, hasn't it been great to hear from different voices as we've gone through this series, which we began at the beginning of January? It's just been fun for me to see how God communicates the same biblical truths through each of these unique personalities. So we're grateful for each of the people. Uh, and last Sunday, Carl talked about the glories of the new creation. And he threw something in there that you may, may have missed, but it was really good news to me. He said something like, all dogs go to heaven and are reunited with us in the new heavens and the new earth. Now, I... 100% agree with his sound exegetical work. Um, but I have a question. Uh, well, here's my dog, and I really would like to spend eternity with Pebbles. She is the greatest dog ever. I say that to her every day. 
But I've got a question for Carl. What happens if you've had more than one dog? <laughs> it's a big problem. Look at our first dog when our kids were young. Now, how is that dog not going to eat pebbles? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, that has nothing to do with today's sermon, but I'm, I have the mic, so I can do whatever I want, right? <laughs> you should pray. Pray. Well, we're actually going to look at this parable of the new wineskins that Jesus tells in Luke chapter 5. And this parable and the, one, and the other parts of what he says, his teaching, come right in the middle of a series of five encounters that Jesus has uh, where he faces a new situation, new people, new place each time, and he just amazes everyone by how he interacts with each one of those because he's the Son of God. But in each of these five accounts in Luke 5 and 6, Jesus is resisted by the Pharisees and the scribe. In the beginning, they're just annoyed with him, but by the end, in counter 5, they are filled with fury, the Bible tells us. It's very puzzling because the Pharisees had so much in common with Jesus. They had the same basic theology, the same reverence for the scriptures, reverence for the feasts and the rituals of, of being the people of God, of Israel. And he, didn't, he agreed with them more than he agreed with anyone else in their theology, in what they thought and taught. Jesus was the new Moses, the one who fulfills God's uh, ancient promises. He and his whole family kept the law and all of the festivals and feasts re uh, very religiously. He didn't come to tear down the traditions that had been kept by Israel forever. So it's puzzling. But it happens because Jesus is doing a new thing. Now, it's a new thing rooted in an old thing. With Jesus the King come new ways to bring people back to God. But Jesus never speaks ill of the law, but he always says we need to bring it to perfection or completion. Now, the specific controversy comes up because of a question about fasting. But by the end of the story, we'll clearly see that the real issue is not fasting, but about how Jesus' kingdom changes the way we live individually and the way we live our lives together. So let's, let's read uh, this passage from Luke 5. They said to Jesus, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours go on eating and drinking. And Jesus answered, Can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and in those days he will, they will fast. And then he told them this parable. No one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Otherwise, they will have torn the new garment, and the patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, wants the new, for they say, the old is better. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for these two parables that speak powerfully to us today. And we pray that as we study this passage and reflect on what your message is for us today, that you're, you would open our eyes and our hearts and our minds to your truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So all of you remember Levi, also known as Matthew. He was a notorious sinner. He was not only a traitor to his people, siding with Rome, but he was uh, the kind of guy that you would meet in 
Chicago in the 1930s. You know, he would drill your kneecaps to get your tax money. He was a great sinner. And then he met Jesus, and his life was transformed. And he was a, a wealthy man even after he gave back all the money that he did. So he threw a great feast at his home because he wanted Jesus to meet his friends and not just hang out with all those religious people. So Jesus was the guest of honor with many tax collectors and sinners at Levi or Matthew's house. Now this created a big problem. One, Jesus is hanging around people who have bad reputations and that reputation started to rub off on him. And second, Jesus and his followers are feasting, not fasting, something the scribes and the Pharisees and even John the Baptist's disciples did. So the Pharisees are upset. Now, before we can understand why they're so upset, we need to understand a little bit more about fasting in first century Judaism. Fasting is what believers did in that culture, in that time, to bring their body into sync with unpleasant or difficult realities. You don't feast when everything is going wrong, and there was a lot wrong in Israel in the first century. Now, when Americans get depressed, we are famous for not fasting, but binge eating on food or media or whatever it is that you do. That's how you deal with your depression. It's, of course, completely unhelpful. Fasting can be a good thing. It can help bring our bodies into sync with living in a world that is going horribly wrong. Maybe sin has been uncovered in your life or in your community. That's not the time to feast. It's time to fast and pray. Or someone has come down with a critical illness. All hope is not lost. It's time to fast and pray. Or maybe you're facing a really difficult decision, like I did almost a year ago when I was asked to consider coming here. It's time to fast and pray. Because when we fast, our bodies get weak and we realize that we are utterly dependent on God for life and health. And we pray more fervently. So in Jesus' day, Jewish people fasted for many reasons. They fasted because of the nation's sins. They fasted because they were experiencing an absence of God's presence. And they were frustrated after 400 years of not hearing from a prophet, of not seeing God's promises fulfilled. Just three chapters earlier in Luke, there was a wonderful older saint named Anna. You probably know about her. She was a prophetess and had been a widow for decades. And she stayed in the temple precincts, day and night, worshiping and fasting and praying, calling out to God to redeem Jerusalem. Now, some people today in our culture would see someone doing this and say, they're just wasting their life. But Anna didn't think so. She was praying, lamenting, where is the bridegroom of Israel? And she was there when God answered her prayer. She saw the baby Jesus arrive at the temple with his parents. She saw the hope of Jerusalem and the world. And she began to give thanks to God and talk about Jesus to everyone who was waiting in the temple on that day. Now fast forward 30 years, it is time finally for the God of Israel, the bridegroom, to make himself more fully known, to begin his public ministry. And this man from Nazareth, which you could loosely translate Nowheresville, came on the scene and he started healing people and forgiving their sins, feasting with repentant sinners, plucking the grain and healing on the Sabbath. The Pharisees just did not go for this. They had a very strict ritual, fasting twice a week, Mondays and Thursdays. They prayed for God to send the bridegroom, and then the bridegroom shows up, and they miss the whole thing. 
The Pharisees want to know why Jesus isn't fasting. So Jesus takes this question, this issue very seriously. He asks a question, and then he tells two parables. So let's look at how he responds. First, his, his question. Can you make the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? Now, I have officiated and attended a lot of weddings in my life. And there are crazy things that happen at weddings. Uh, I could, I could tell you so many stories, but just one. We're standing there, I'm standing, you know, up on the dais, and the bride comes through the door, and that's the moment, right? All eyes are on her, except that the maid of honor, her sister, is still fixing her hair in the next building. And so there's some scuttlebutt, and then a woman, I think the mother of the bride, comes up and explains, don't start the wedding, so we, I don't know what I did. Anyway, that was the strangest thing that ever happened to me. How did she not get the memo? That's not what maid of honor are supposed to do. But one thing I have never seen at a wedding, where the host says, oh, that wine over there, you can't have it. That food over there, that's for other people. You're to fast and pray. See, that's why Jesus only needs a question. The answer is in the question. No one fasts at a wedding. It's a time for joy and feasting. But Jesus wants this point to be so clear, so he aims two powerful parables to drive home this truth. The first parable is about a piece of cloth sewn on an old pair of pants or an old dress. And what Jesus is saying, that would be nuts. And it's not that he doesn't like the design of these pants, okay? It's that, and you probably remember this when you were younger, when you had a, they didn't have pre-shrunk clothes. So when you bought a piece of new cotton and put it on an old pair of pants, what happened? That cloth shrinks. It rips the threads. It's powerful, this shrinking action. So what Jesus is saying is, that's a ridiculous idea, to sew a piece of new cloth on the, on the old clothes. You do not mix new and old. Then he tells a longer parable, verses 37 and 38 of Luke 5, with a similar truth. This would be a goat skin very similar to what they would use in the first century. They would use either lamb skin or goat skin, and they would have a lot of wine, it, not just these little Boda bags, sorry about that, kids, um, but a lot of wine, and this is how they would store it. And as the grape juice, the new juice, was put into the wine skin, over time it would ferment, and the skin would stretch and expand because the gases from the fermenting wine would be released. And what Jesus is saying, you, you would never take an old wineskin that had already done that work and use it again with new wine. The brittle fibers of the old skin wouldn't be able to handle the expansion, and it would break, and you'd lose both the new wine and the old wineskins. I'm not sure what they did with the old wineskins, but you don't put in new. So what Jesus is saying is, my arrival as the Messiah, as the one you have longed for, is new cloth. It's new wine. Do not try to put this into what is old. They just don't go together. You'll lose both the old and the new when you do this. When Jesus enters our world, our lives and our world face an entirely new situation that demands a new attitude and new practices. And when the Pharisees hang on to their old rituals, they are prevented from experiencing the amazing new reality. 
of joy with the bridegroom at the wedding. Fasting when Jesus is right with you is like fasting at a wedding. It's like ripping up new clothes to repair old clothes and like putting new wine into old wineskins. It makes no sense. Now, with few exceptions, the most religious people in Jesus' day, the Pharisees, the ones who were faithful attenders of worship and practiced all these rituals, they were perfectly happy with their old wine. They had no desire for new wine. And they fasted and prayed that God would return, but they had lost the ability to see when God was right in their midst. They loved their old practices so much, they had lost the desire for the new. Now, when you hear this, you might think, well, what does that have to do with us today? We might look at ourselves, well, I would never be pharisaical or ritualistic. Rituals are the are Old Testament. And we are living in the new ways of the Spirit. And if you're tempted to think that, you're missing the power of Jesus' word for you today. You see, ritual is just a religious word for routine or habit. And we all have rituals. We all have habits. Some of them are just centered on an old reality, an old way of thinking and living. But when Jesus came, when he rose from the dead, he sent his Holy Spirit to infuse us with new life, new wine, the energy, the power of God's kingdom, the Spirit in us to produce the fruits of the Spirit, love and joy and peace and patience, goodness and gentleness and self-control. When that happens to you, you want to throw a feast and invite all your friends who haven't heard this good news again. God's kingdom came, and it's still coming in our midst today. And Jesus died to ransom us and make us priests so that we might go into the world and witness to the truth of the new wine of the gospel. But we live in a mixed reality, a world of the now but not yet. Yes, the Lamb is conquered and reigns on the throne, and that is cause for rejoicing and for feasting on every Lord's Day. But the kingdom of the world has not yet become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Everything is not all right in the world. We know that. There are actual wars going on right in front of us, and those that are hidden that don't make the news. There is injustice. There is rejection of the true king of the world. And so we do rejoice, but we also need time to fast and to pray. And we will begin that this Ash Wednesday with very meaningful services at noon and seven that will help us to begin a time of preparation of 40 days to follow with Jesus 40 days in the wilderness. But back to the point for us today. Every one of us is stuck on old wine, old habits. Think about how you spend your time. Think about the rituals that you have in your life. What do you do when you wake up? How do you spend your evenings? What do you do when you're around other people? There's probably three possibilities. One. Your ritual is a complete lack of ritual. No plan, who cares? I doubt there are too many Presbyterians like that, but there might be a few. Second, we purposely order our lives with rituals and habits that take little thought of our place in God's kingdom. They, they are not integrating the, the reality of how everything changed when we met Jesus Christ and his new wine came into our lives. The third choice is that we can purposely order our lives with rituals and habits that make sense and help us to grow as disciples of Jesus, as priests of his coming kingdom. But to do that, we have to 
be willing to give up anything, any old practice that prevents us from being fully present to God. Many people in the world today could care less about the new wine because they like their old wine and their old life just the way it is. Don't give up on them. Don't let their rejection discourage you. There are plenty of people in the world right now who realize that the old wine that they've been using is not cutting it. They would completely reorder their lives if they heard about something new, real, true. But if we're going to get people out of the old, we have to actually invite them into a life that is new. Everybody's selling old wine marked with a new wine label, and people are exhausted with fakes and frauds. We can't just invite them to buy the label, but we have to show them how to put on new clothes and drink new wine and experience new wineskins. Invite them into a community of disciples who read their Bibles, who share deeply from their heart, who support one another in their suffering, who care for the poor and the sick, who have one another in their homes to rejoice together with God's blessings, and who have a concrete hope that is evident even in the deepest pain and suffering. We've just got to get to the point where we realize that the old wineskins that we've relied on have burst, that we cannot have or taste the new wine of Jesus without new wineskins. We need new practices that match our identity as a royal priesthood, as courageous followers of Jesus, witnessing to the truth. And we live in a perfect time for new wineskins. Our lives have been upended for the past two years, and so has the church. We have a chance to step back and say, some of the old clothes that we're still wearing, Grace Commons, don't work in our current context. It's time for new wineskins, new clothes, new practices for a new missional situation. Grace Commons is moving forward to carry out our mission to build a flourishing church that makes disciples of Jesus Christ here in Boulder and beyond. We're in this time of transition. We are discerning God's plan for the future of Grace Commons together. Please pray. Ask how you can get involved. Find these new wineskins and new ways of being faithful to the new wine of the gospel and God will bless you. The new wine that Jesus brings to the wedding at Cana in Galilee is so good that the host and the guests can't talk of anything else. It's 1957 Chateau Lafitte Rothschild. It's good. It's like drinking liquid um, myrrh. It's amazing. That's what we're after, and that's what we're inviting people into. Let's pray together. God, we thank you this morning for, for Jesus, for the amazing way that he speaks into our lives, challenges us at the core of who we are and our identity, and calls us to something new, something better, something life-giving. Lord, help us discover what that means both individually and collectively, as we go forward together. And help us in this time of Lent, beginning this Wednesday, to explore and understand in new ways your faithfulness. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
may be seated. Let's continue as we join our hearts together in prayer. Oh, good morning, Lord. Thank you so much for your presence here with us. How blessed we are to have a God that is so near to us. How blessed we are to worship a God who loves us, who knows the cries of our hearts and hears all of our prayers. God, we thank you for this nearness, for your goodness and your faithfulness. And Lord, it's from this awareness that we come to you this morning, burdened and heavy-hearted, from all the news of the mounting devastation in Ukraine. God, we don't even know how to pray. So we come before you, we look to you, we lean on you, God, to help us. We claim your promise. And we trust that you are, in fact, near to the brokenhearted. And we boldly ask that you would protect lives. God, we ask that you would intervene. We ask that you would send your supernatural peace to blanket that region and this situation. 
We ask, God, that your peace that surpasses understanding would truly guard hearts and minds, and that your peace, God, would impact both the just and the unjust. God, we've heard and seen so much in the past few days. Some even have personal connections, and so we come now, come before you in silence and lift our own hearts and our prayers to you. Lord, thank you for your nearness, and thank you that you invite us to share our burdens with you. Would you help us to trust you with them? And in your faithfulness, we're reminded this morning how good it is to gather and to be together. How good it is to gather and to worship you. How good it is to hear your truth. And yet this parable of old wineskins and and new wine is challenging. That tension between what is old and good and what is new that we need to be open to. Lord, would you help us? Would you help each one of us to come into understanding and soften our hearts and open our eyes, Lord, that we could see and be able to adjust and adapt that we can partner with you. And Lord, we pause even now. We use this morning, this time in silence to allow your Holy Spirit to come and search us, to allow your Holy Spirit to show us our own limitations, where we need to let go. Come, Holy Spirit. Oh, Spirit, you are our wonderful counselor. We thank you for your loving conviction and how eager you are to lead us as we look for your guidance on this narrow path. Thank you, Lord, that in this way, this is how we find the abundant life Jesus came to give us. And Lord, we thank you for your new wine. And Jesus gives evidence at his first miracle, that your new wine is the best wine. So make us thirsty for it. Make us ready, Lord, to be a new wineskin that can carry this new wine to share it with those around us. Pour your new wine through us for this church. Lord, in fresh ways for our own families and our neighbors, our coworkers, and Lord, even our enemies. Lord, we want to be part of a new move of your spirit for this city and in our nation and over this great world. So together we join in saying the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
It's who I am. It's who I am. I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers only you provide, cause we know just what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect. So unexplainable, I, I can hardly think as you call me, deeper still as you call me, deeper still as you call me, deeper still into love, 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 you're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am, you're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To us, you are perfect in all. You are perfect in all of your ways. God, you're perfect in all of your ways to us. It's love so undeniable. I, I can hardly speak peace so unexplainable I I can hardly think Thank you Annex Praise Band How about that? <laughs> Woo! Go ahead and have a seat because I want to share some really joyful family news I'm going to invite Steve Cartwright to come up Steve uh, is retiring this year after, after his $1 a year job ended. We didn't lay him off, he came to us, don't, don't, don't worry. But Steve has done a, a masterful job of leading our men's ministry, our men's life program for many years, and he's here to tell you 
that the future is bright. And indeed it is. Thank you, Randy. So on a Tuesday morning back in November, I stood in front of the 80 or so men who were president of Men's Life and announced that I was retiring, that this would be my last year to lead men's ministry and to lead men's life. And I said at that time that I hoped that the Holy Spirit would work in the hearts of the men present and that somebody would come forward and express interest in being the next director of men's ministry. And God is good. The Spirit did work. And the Spirit worked in the heart of Dave Pascoe. And he came to me and said he wanted to talk about being director, and this morning I'm pleased to announce that Dave Pascoe will be the next director of men's ministry. Um. <clears throat> Sir? So if you don't know Dave, I'll tell you a little bit about him. He is an ordained Presbyterian pastor. He served churches for over 30 years and retired in late 2014 and moved to Lafayette with his wife, Deborah, to be close to their daughter and son-in-law and their family, who were already a part of Grace Commons. They started attending Grace Commons in 2015 and became members of Grace Commons. In early 2016, he began attending Men's Life. He became the teaching leader in 2016-2017 Men's Life and also taught again as a team of four in 2019 and 2020. So he's well acquainted with men's ministry and, and Grace Commons. And so some reasons why he is such a good fit to be the next director. He's a pastor, he's an ordained pastor. He's led men's ministries in other churches. He's a trained life coach. He knows Grace Commons, he knows the men of men's life, he knows a lot of people in the church. And one of the things that probably excites me the most is he, three generations of his family are involved in Grace Commons. He and his wife Deborah, their daughter Marie and son-in-law Matt Emmett are involved as well as their two children who are now up in Sunday school. So he has the opportunity to engage with three different generations of men in the congregation. So I think that's a special fit. So Dave, I have something for you. I'm gonna pass along to you the official Grace Commons Men's Ministry Baton. <laughs> Welcome to the staff of Grace Commons. As a uh, retired pastor, you might think I would know better than to say yes, but God put a call on my heart, and I'm here, and I'm actually excited to do this, and part of we did this in the first hour, so this isn't brand new to me, but I got to thinking about this. This is a team sport. I'm going to hold this for the next lap, but this is a call out to all the guys who are here right now and all the guys in the church. You're new wineskins too. I'm a new wineskin in this role. We all need to be filled with new wine. Jesus wants to do something new in each of our lives, amen? Amen. And it's gonna happen. You can't make it stop, so don't try. Just get on board and guys, be part of the men's ministry, amen? Amen. Is he a pastor or what? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Appreciate it. Well, Dave gave us the charge uh, beautifully. So before we uh, receive the benediction, I want to make sure you know that if you need to pray with someone, even if you don't have words, they will pray for you. You can do that right after the service with one of our prayer ministers. And now, may the God of hope fill you with the new wine of the gospel, with the Holy Spirit. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And God's people said, amen. Go in peace.